Hey guys, I'm uh, Ted here to give you another uh, lecture and for this lecture we are going to discuss uh, we're going to wrap up our discussion actually of, uh, of cities of uh, the development of the early cities in the, uh, in the Republic. Um, in our last lecture we discussed uh, political machines of course um, how, uh, how they uh, really were a detriment to the cities but they also provided um, real benefits. Uh, they, they, have, they have to uh, perform needed uh, services that that the cities and that the uh, communities living in these cities really needed. Um, we also looked at the uh, we also looked at the sanitation problem and the pollution problem that affected these cities. The, these cities were noted for having poor sanitation, water drinking water was hazardous. We looked at the um, the pollution. Uh, pollution was everywhere. They were using uh, they were burning coal not only for industrial purposes but also for personal heating purposes and also uh, cooking purposes. They were cooking with all of these things and uh, many of the uh, many of the cities had these uh, horrendous, these just awful smoke clouds over them. Um, and of course, the animal problem: uh, uh, horses and goats and cows and what's not. Um, producing manure and the cities having uh, and again the cities don't really have any full-time staff and they don't really have the uh, the type of municipal government that we that we are familiar with now these were really just political machines uh, guys who were going to do their their public service but also enrich themselves um, these these guys uh, and the inhabitants they really didn't have any sort of like long-term planning long-term solution for the uh, for the amount of, uh, of waste produced by not just the animals but also by the people living in these cities all right and with that said uh we'll jump right back on to uh to our to uh discussing the political machines and, and we'll look at one uh one ward boss or or one member of the uh tammany ring uh, george plunkett um and, and we'll begin with uh with a man named william reardon who in 1905, the journalist William Reardon, he interviewed George Plunkett. George Washington Plunkett is a full name, but George Plunkett is uh, is um, you know, his uh, his common name. Um, Plunkett was a Tammany Hall ward boss. Um, he was uh, the the interview uh, that that Reardon um, between Reardon and, and Plunkett produced a book, Plunkett of Tammany Hall, which includes Plunkett's very own admission of his participation and his benefit from honest graft. Um, now, to be, uh, to be certain, uh, Plunkett made the, the, um, he made the argument and uh, he, in his mind, rightfully distinguished between honest graft and dishonest graft. The Plunkett honest graft was completely appropriate and honest, gra uh, honest graft involved the acquisition of property um, that would be needed for public projects and making an inflated profit on that property resale to the city. Dishonest graft would include something like uh, uh, buying land and using one's influence as a member of the uh, of the, the city government, the city management, to have a public work built on it. Um, in the book, Plunkett, who are quite frank in its approach and execution of its duties and its expectations of his uh, of, of his constituents, explained how the boss system worked and how it benefited all involved. He related that his commitment to serving the inhabitants of his ward um, w w uh, w was based on uh, was based on his uh, personal duties and his approach to his duties um, to 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 serve them, regardless of whether they were, had I said it earlier, the deserving poor or um, or or not. Uh, as opposed to the outlook of many others, like uh, many many other social um, social aid advocates who wanted to only give to the deserving poor, uh, these types of bonds um, and practices infiltrated all levels of civic management, but made it very difficult for civic reformers to break in. Uh, nepotism was really rampant at family members of the political bosses always held a monopoly on high office, even low office. Um, and of course, the recent immigrants, you know, and, and particularly those immigrants from areas where voting didn't even exist, where where the governments uh, were were autocratic in nature, um, where where the governments uh, restricted the franchise. People coming from the the newly unified Italy 
or the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the Russian Empire. Uh, many of them never held any type of political rights at all. Uh, they, they never had voting rights. And the fact that someone was willing to treat them with kindness and to pay them for their votes, they, they, they rushed, uh, they, they, they caused a stampede of recent immigrants toward party bosses. They wanted, they, they, they quickly found out that you can get uh, paid money to vote a certain way. So they went ahead and they voted a certain way. And it's not that, that uh, groups like uh, the Tammany Ring or so forth, um, Tammany Hall, uh, that was a democratic group. It's not like uh, there was just one party doing this. No, all the parties were doing it. There were Republican um, political machines as well. For those of you familiar with uh, the movie Gangs of New York, um, the uh, Bill the Butcher. Bill the Butcher is a party boss. And he uh, ensures that the, the local immigrants all vote one way. Um, uh, the, the character that, uh, the Irish character played by John C., uh, I think it's John C. Riley, um, that they shave up and that they, uh, make look presentable and that they present as a, uh, an alternative to, uh, build, um, build of, uh, the butcher's candidate, um, sort of, sort of, uh, sort of deviates from how things normally went. These uh these political bosses they they zeroed in and they, they locked down their argument um they, they they locked down their target audience, their their constituents. Um much the way Plunkett stated that that they performed their duties. But uh but also those too familiar with the um the show Boardwalk Empire. Uh Nucky Thompson is a political boss and he uh the uh, the sort of uh, prohibition aspect of it and the uh the, the backstabbing and then the sabotage and, and all the rest of that stuff sort of taken away from it um he he functions much the same way the political bosses did they they were enormously wealthy they they took from the city and they uh performed services one can think of the relationship between nucky thompson and chalky white in that show has been uh, symbolic of the nature of these groups. Um, Chalky White uh, ensures that the African American community uh, in Atlantic City votes for, uh, Republican, votes for Enoch Thompson. Enoch Thompson, in return, gives Chalky uh, certain outright privileges and benefits that Chalky later um, uh, that that he sort of. Um, uh, um, passes out. He sort of uh, disposes of, of at will towards uh, high-ranking lieutenants and other prominent members of his community, and, and he sort of offers protection to them. They are, that that's another thing that the uh, the immigrants looked for from the political bosses were protection. They wanted protection from uh, groups that would do them harm. They wanted uh, protection in the form of being able to find housing and uh, and money and money to make purchases to pay their rent and so forth and to pay for food and clothing and whatnot um, all the all the little creature comforts uh, back to this voting um, it was it was a win it was a, it was a win win for the voting and it was a win for the political bosses um, the bosses uh, turned turned out to be very helpful for their lives. The machines bought their votes. Sometimes the machine, uh, the political machines, bought multiple votes. They they, they had the, uh, the the immigrants cast multiple ballots in, at different polling stations. Now this was the type of conduct that enraged urban reformers. They they were fighting to eliminate bribery and corruption. There were a number of reasons that the reformers wanted to change uh, and, and stop all all graft, uh, whether it was honest or dishonest. Um, they, and, and they also wanted, uh, and it was also reason why they wanted to create that system of meritocracy um, to uh, to sort of uh, quash the nepotism that that was going on. They they wanted better accounting of public funds, uh, and, and periodically good government campaign arose, uh, but they often failed to succeed because the political machines offered immediate cash or immediate assistance, something the reformers. Um, couldn't do that. Their ethics and their principles would not allow them to simply pay the immigrants for uh, for their assistance. You had to do it because it was the right thing to do. Um, all of these activities led to another phenomena in the cities that was muck raking journalism, uh, which is German uh, journalism that exposed the corrupt practices of monopolies or, or uh, and the abuses 
by urban authorities. Now, one of the most prominent muckrakers uh, of the time was a man named Lincoln Steffens. Uh, and now Steffens, in 1904, he published another book uh, entitled Shame of the Century. The book details uh, Stephens, uh, or, or Steffens' um, cross-country tour detailing the operations of various political machines that control cities of the nation and the weaknesses of the machines uh, that might allow for good government to be introduced. Stevens found um, when he was doing his research that contrary to popular opinion, the immigrants were not the leaders or the brains of the political machines or, or their operation. The actual heads of the political machines were natural born Americans, nativists. Um, and, and they were very often the economic leaders of cities. Um, and, and, and he researched in, in cities like Minneapolis, uh, Chicago, and St. Louis. So it's not just those Atlantic seaboard cities. It's also permeating deep into, um, in, into uh, the Midwest of the United States. Now, by the, uh, by the late 19th and early 20th century, um, we also begin to see this as a period of uh, a number of great innovations and inventions uh, coming out onto the market. Uh, a number of them came to benefit urban life. Uh, the greatest uh, benefit to urban life at this time was the invention of the streetcar. Now, the first streetcars were horse-drawn. Um, they they, they looked like horse-drawn wagons, really. Um, but after 1819, 1890, they were electrified. Um, and, and a nice little story was that they were often called trolleys. And the uh, the original name of the Dodgers back when they were in Brooklyn, one of their one of their original nicknames was the Trolley Dodgers. Trolley Dodgers got got uh, shortened just to Dodgers. Um, trolley dodging was a sport um, to where you would sort of you know uh, try to race uh, across the tracks. Had to have the uh, had the trolley with emotion. Had to train with emotion. Uh, with the objective of course being to beat the train and to stay alive um, Again, this is just some of the early spectator or uh, early urban um, inhabitants sort of like uh, Recreation re recreational activities But uh, but yes, uh, though those early streetcars they became electrified they, they enabled city to expand it eliminated the need this this uh Urban transportation, the development of urban transportation eliminated the need for workers to live so close to their place of work. A, a worker could simply ride the streetcar to work and then ride the streetcar back home. Once this became fashionable, residential housing tended to follow, um, and, and it followed, the, and it followed the uh, the same path of the commute route. Um, this led to the rise of suburbs. We, we began to see a lot of suburban centers develop. Um, uh, as more and more areas were put under development for residential habitation. As the 20th century went on, the streetcars were complemented uh, first by, by, by the bicycle and then later by the automobile. So that roughly around 1920, um, you can see cars, uh, streets that have automobiles and, and trucks, uh, streetcars or, or, tre or uh, trains. Uh, the subway system in New York is a big one of them. Um, in Phoenix, the, the Metro Rail, the Light Rail is, um, is another one. Uh, and of course, uh, buses, city busing also became uh, fashionable uh, at around this time too. So you had this, this wide network of transportation for, for, uh, for city. You begin to see the progress. You begin to see the, uh, the enriching and the, and the embetterment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, urban life. It's not, it's not the other uh, squalor of the 1880s or, or, or anything like that. Um, and, and of course, the, the main thing with American cities is the skyscraper. Um, skyscrapers rose to prominence during this time. Um, and, and skyscrapers, uh, they, they not only um, allow cities, because at this time cities are expanding, so, so, they're, so they're growing out, but now you can also grow city upwards. You, you can make them, uh, you can make cities taller. Um, and they, they were going up the heights on, on, uh, unimaginable, unthought of before. Steel girders and elevators, improvements to elevators made skyscraper construction possible. Steel girders were, were able to bear the weight of additional stories uh, or, or, or um, floors without buckling. Previous brick buildings could only be built about five stories or so because of the immense weight and pressure bearing down on the first floor. Um, 
they, 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 they could not be built very high because of the other uh, they, they could also not be built very uh, high because of the physical toll that it took you know um, lugging or, 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 or uh, hand carrying uh, the building materials needed up all those flights of stairs it's a it's a hassle in and of itself just moving this equipment up and down up and down um, elevators uh, elevators had been in use since early modern times but the safety of these elevators were, was always uh, in doubt. Um, by the late uh, 19th century, their safety had increased significantly. Um, you could now, um, be, and, and again, looking back at what we thought our uh, our discussion on the uh, on um, the Transcontinental Railroad, looking at George Westinghouse and, and the air brake. Um, by the 1890s, there were brakes on uh, on the elevators. There were safety brakes. The safety brakes allowed um, uh, allowed uh, re uh, gave reassurances that one the uh, the equipment being carried wouldn't be lopping, and also the, the the men, the men who were uh, in the trains, who were in the elevators, who were carrying up the equipment, that their lives wouldn't be lost if the cable broke. If the cable broke, then boom, safety lock would snap into place, and the, and everyone's life will be will be saved. Um, the Great Fire of Chicago, and then this occurred in 1871. The Great Fire of Chicago helped usher in um, the, the, the new style of building, the, the, uh, the skyscrapers. Early skyscraper designers like uh, Louis Sullivan helped to implement this new design. Uh, did this new design in 1906? The San Francisco earthquake occurred, um, and again, this provided a great opportunity for a, a major urban center to rebuild and to use this new American architectural style, the skyscraper. Um, masonry buildings shattered during the earthquake. Um, these steel girders, these steel frames uh, buildings, these skyscrapers, they tended not to collapse so easily. They were able to uh, withstand um, the, the, the sudden uh, seismic uh, shuffle, the, the, the jostling. That, that occurred during the, uh, the these earthquakes. Um, uh, settlement houses. Settlement houses were another uh, major development during this time. Um, and and they, they, they came to largely dot the urban landscape. The most uh, famous of all, uh, and the first in the United States, was of course Hull House. Um, and, and Hull House had been uh, created and opened by Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr. Uh, they jointly, uh, the, those two ladies jointly opened Hull House in Chicago. Now, Adams and, and, uh, and Starr, uh, they were both upper middle class reformers. Um, and, and Adams, while, while she was touring Europe, uh, she had observed the young men of Oxford University helping um, urban residents, uh, people uh, living in the slums, over at Toynbee Hall. Uh, this gave her the idea behind Hall House. Um, Star and Adams, along with some of their upper class friends, would help immigrant women acclimate to the United States. They often took on the role of championing, uh, championing um, causes for immigrant women. Uh, um, may, many women whose husbands abandoned them. Um, they provided a rudimentary uh, language classes to the kids. They offered they offered child care services, uh, child care services to ensure um, to ensure that the women would have a a um, a, a safe place to leave their kids that they went off to work themselves. Uh, before then, a habit had been to uh, particularly among Italian mothers to be to uh, dip some bread uh, into some wine and give it to the child and hopefully you know uh, the child will become intoxicated and you know uh, simply simply uh, sleep or just be sluggish until the mother came back um, uh, and of course that was just abhorrent uh, just, just abhorrent to um, the uh, the women uh, working at these uh, settlement houses because many of them tended to be uh, teetotalers, many of them were um, were uh, prohibitionists, um, uh, but uh, but the but at Hull House, 
um, public services like proper policing, street light, uh, lighting, trash collection, sanitation. Uh, the, the, the people who operated these uh, settlement houses, they advocated those things for the immigrant uh, ethnic ghettos. Um, settlement houses worked uh, also to undermine the influence of the political machines because they're coming in and they're providing direct services to these immigrant communities, something that the uh, political machines had an exclusive monopoly on be uh, beforehand. Um, Jane Addams. Jane Addams wrote an autobiography. She wrote uh, exactly, I think, uh, a couple of autobiographies um, uh, written during her lifetime, but, but uh, her first one uh, was written 20 years uh, 20 years um, into her, uh, her, her, uh, her running her operations at Hull House. And it's entitled 20 Years at Hull House. The book, uh, the book describes how Adams and her colleagues performed community outreach, uh, how they helped community members after surgeries, uh, and the, um, they, they helped community members in the wake of domestic violence attacks. Um, they, they were there uh, championing in, uh, community members through terminal illnesses, uh, through childbirth, there were there, there's even humorous accounts um, that 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 uh, Adam uh, puts into uh, puts into the book, um, namely an account of uh, a Hull House agent who went out to uh, a family, an immigrant family. Uh, this uh, young Italian mother, um, she was being persuaded not to give her children uh, bread soaked with wine. Um, uh, and, and this, uh, this mother, this, this Italian woman, uh, her very first instinct is to be hospitable and to provide her guests with a cup of wine. Now, uh, the, the, the Hull House, um, the, the Hull House representatives, you know, they're taken aback by it. They, they overly refuse it. They, they're all teetotalers. They support prohibition. Uh, so, so they, so they, um, shocked that they, they refuse. The Italian mother, uh, a light goes off in her head. She says, ah, okay, it's the American. I have to get the American drink. So she goes out and she gets a bottle of whiskey, um, you know, to, to, to give uh, to her American, an American drink for her an American guest. Uh, that, that's uh, sort of like uh, some of the anecdotes, little anecdotes inside her book. Um, it's a very interesting uh, perspective on Hull House and, and I, I get the, uh, the prevailing attitudes of... Uh, Adams and, and her contemporaries. Um, now, uh, the settlement houses, they, they, they did a lot of good, but they also had some heavy-handed tactics when dealing with, uh, with these immigrant communities. Um, they, 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 they tended to try to preserve as much of the uh, cultural traditions and they tended to respect those ethnic uh, com immigrant communities, but they were also completely segregated establishments. They, there was no uh, let's say an African American settlement house, or a settlement house that would tr that would uh, cater to African American needs. These were attempts to bridge the gap between the immigrants from Europe and the uh, the uh, the old stock Americans, the the old stock American population. Um, uh, and of course, uh, around this time, uh, also around this time cities of the, Rep of the Republic began to develop their own identities. And one of the ways they did so was through athletics, professional sports leagues, um, such as uh, baseball's uh, American League and, and National League. They were developing at this time. They were becoming very important. Uh, the transcontinental railroads made it possible for baseball teams in, let's say, Cincinnati to play Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the transcontinental railroads and the, and the railroad uh, infrastructure in general made it possible for a baseball team in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Reds, to go to St. Louis and play the, uh, the, the baseball teams in St. Louis. It enabled the, uh, the baseball team in Boston to uh, zip on down and play the baseball team in Philadelphia. It enabled baseball teams in New York to play against baseball teams in in Pittsburgh, uh, so 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 they um, they, they they sort of um, benefited from this uh, from this infrastructure from this uh, transportation inf infrastructure. They also enabled cities to uh, sort of say, well, well, I uh, to exhibit civic pride because the team playing in their city won this league's championship or they won this game or 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 any uh, number of reasons. People were drawn 
to uh, to identify a beam of this city because of those athletic teams. Um, city newspapers. City newspapers also gave rise to this urban identity. Um, and of course, governments themselves, civic governments uh, themselves, did a, a lot of work to spread their own civic gospel and generate their own brand of civic pride. And with that being said, we'll break this lecture. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about the uh, the discussion, uh, the, the uh, lectures on cities. Um, I'm Ted, and I'll see you guys next time for another lecture.